So I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, thank you also to Rachel Kleinfeld for being here. Rachel is the author of this book that I'm holding up with this uh, rather uh, challenging looking cover. It's called A Savage Order, How the World's Deadliest Countries Can Forge a Path to Security. And the cover itself looks as if it's been through a bit of violence itself. Um, it's, we talk about violence in many ways, and uh, whether it's state violence or the type of violence that we experience in society on a daily basis. What is it that drew you to the topic of violence? I know you're an international relations specialist and you're currently at the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. Perhaps it's peace that's driven you <laughs> towards the subject of violence. So um, my background is in human rights and international development. And when I started in that 20-some um, years ago, I was working in the, Soviet, in the former Soviet Union, right as it was falling apart. So 1992, 93, there was hyperinflation. The government didn't turn on the heat in St. Petersburg that winter because they couldn't figure out how to get enough money for the heat. And I was working as a dancer, actually. Um, I was working as a dancer in a beautiful, beautiful theater right near the Peter and Paul Fortress. And um, the only problem with the whole gig was that it was right above the biggest mafia casino in St. Petersburg. And it was an era in which there really wasn't private property. It was still kind of right on the edge of the Soviet Union. And so those of us who were working in the theater had to figure out housing. And one of the groups that had figured out private property was the mafia. And so some of the troop were renting apartments from um, the mafiosi. And they uh, had a landlord-tenant dispute. I don't actually remember what it was, but there was some, you know, we need our pipes fixed or something like that. Um, and suddenly one day our friends were gone and we couldn't find them and we wandered the streets of St. Petersburg it was before cell phones, you know, I'm dating myself a little bit, but well before cell phones and there was no real way to contact people. And um, finally we found them and they had been tied up naked, left in a forest. And um, I thought, my God, uh, this is pretty serious uh, business. Um, and it was a warning, they, they weren't harmed. And um, the next year, I was in college, I went to DC to a NATO Partnership for Peace meeting. This was like the anteroom to NATO. It was where all of the Eastern European countries were, were waiting to get into NATO. And um, you had one foreign minister after another get up on the stage. You know, it's one of these big darkened rooms and you're, you have your simultaneous translating, your plug in and um, all very fancy. And they're practically crying on stage saying, we need to get into NATO because of the Russian mob. And I was sitting in the audience thinking, what the hell is NATO gonna do for the Russian mob? Um, it's not organized to do anything about that problem. And so that really got me interested in this kind of violence. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, I too was living in the Soviet Union at the same time. My landlord too was suspect. <laughs> um, but I was, uh, I considered moving when one morning at 4 a.m. the police uh, who were working in cahoots with the landlord uh, kept knocking on the door and insisting that I let them in and they started uh, moving things around violently within the apartment and I did move shortly thereafter. Um, so I, I understand that situation and I certainly understand the way that we looked at that situation and we referred to that situation as a transitional moment where we expected, we in the West in fact were looking at the changes not strictly in the Soviet Union but in Central Europe writ large and particularly in some of the countries that had a tradition of democracy, as going through a tradition, uh, through a transition into democratic forms of governance. Is that what was going on? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I think that was set up it's for that It's a loaded answer. question, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think we were all very hopeful. So at the time we thought, oh, these countries will fall apart and the desire for freedom is great and they will get institutions and we'll help them out and um, they'll be back on track. And I think what happened was we underestimated the power of oligarchy, um, by which I mean the rule of the moneyed few, which is what er how Aristotle used it, the rule of money. And what you saw in that era was um, the people who had figured out how to steal the best from the state. And that tended to be the mafia, but it was also some of the KGB agents. Um, says they knew how to launder money, and so 
these groups that managed to steal a lot and sell it before anyone knew what was going on came to power and they gained so much economic power that they were able to translate it into political power. And so they had this democratic facade, and you saw the same thing in the Ukraine um, and so on at Belarus, that this democratic facade around what was really an oligarchy. And we didn't have words for it because we were still in the world of the 20th century of isms. You know, we, we fought communism and fascism and democracy was gonna win because it was an ideology. We didn't have a word for oligarchy. We didn't know what it was to think about just pure power for power's sake. But that was what was going on in a lot of these places. I, yes, and in fact, I, I recall uh, that it wasn't just the KGB or even just those who were very clever, but in fact, those who were most connected, oftentimes party members, and it was the privatization of public goods and the wealth that allowed them to then suddenly be able to fund and underwrite these new institutions uh, that were non-institutional, but rather structures within society that then, I think, led to these violent and uh, powerful uh, gangs, oftentimes, uh, and different types of organized crime groups. And so then you start focusing on this and, and, and you were observing this and this carried off, carried on in your research over many years? Uh, well, I took, a, I took a 10 year detour to uh -huh. start an organization <laughs> and I got pretty worried after George W. Bush became president and I thought we needed a new way forward in national security. And so I took a decade off, started an organization, did my best to fight that tide. Um, of course, now we've ended up with who we've ended up with. So. Um, I won't say anything further that's political, um, but uh, I came back to this work about four or five years ago, um, and I really wanted to answer the question after Afghanistan, after Iraq, um, after these kinds of wars, was there anything that we could do to make very violent countries better? Because most of what I had seen had been failure. Um, and the first thing I learned was that that was not actually where the violence was. So it was a big surprise to me. I had gone to the, th I'd left my organization and gone to the think tank because I wanted to answer this question. And then when you look at what are the most violent countries in the world, I mean, think about, picture in your head what you think the most violent country in the world is right now. I'll bet half the audience is picturing some Middle Eastern mashup of some sort. The most violent country in the world right now is Brazil. Um, three times, uh, for the last three years, there's been more violent death in Brazil than Syria. And so when you start looking at where violence is happening, it's not in conflict zones nowadays. It's in these highly unequal, highly polarized democracies. So while Iraq and Afghanistan and so on had propelled me into this world, um, it turned out that, that the problem lay elsewhere. And so once you discovered this, and once you were able to look at the data and, and understand that it wasn't necessarily war that actually bred this type of extreme violence, that in fact there were other factors. You wanted to take a look at what those factors were, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so almost no one looks at that kind of thing. There's yes. a whole industry to look at violence and war. You know, yes. we're the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The word peace implies war. You don't yes. talk about peace from this kind of violence. I'm but at the Hoover Institution for <laughs> war revolution and peace. Ah, and yeah. so I too uh, am focused on these very issues. Right, and so this is the, you know, that's how we in international relations talk about it. And crime is just a domestic issue. It's a policing issue. It's low politics versus high politics, less important, except that's where people are being killed. Mexico's had more violent death than Iraq and Afghanistan combined for the last decade. And so I wanted to look at that and it turned out there were very few people actually looking at that. And so the first thing I did actually was brought together all the experts I could find from all over the world um, to say, okay, what do we know? What do we know works against gangs, against organized crime, against these kind of electoral violence? And we actually compiled a pretty serious literature review and it looked pretty good and I was very excited actually. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh great, you know, we know a lot. How do we get this, um, some of these ideas uh, into the bloodstream of a corrupt police uh, institution? Some, and the room just went silent, you know, three days of excited chatter and then just silence. And I realized, well, that's the question I need to answer. It's not what do we do? We actually know a lot about that. It's how do we do it? And, but when you say, how do we deal with the police, for example, there were plans. There were plans that were being conducted by the Department of Defense and even the State Department where they were working with police forces. Was that not enough? Uh, so that's right. I actually started my career on rule of law issues, and that was, you know, we had a whole industry of building the rule of law in these countries. We had an assumption that, it, as I was doing my research, I found to be wrong. The assumption was that um, it really comes from Max Weber. A hundred years ago this year, Max Weber said, 
he's a great sociologist, and he said, you know, the what defines a state is holding the monopoly of legitimate force. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of assumed that if a state did not have the monopoly of legitimate force, especially a democratic state, it must be by accident. It must be too weak to have the monopoly. It must be involved in war, can't control its territory, doesn't have the capability, needs its police trained. And so we went around the world training police and giving them weapons and teaching them about human rights and building capacity, as we say in D.C. And it turned out that that very assumption was flawed. It was, in fact, negative. I mean, some of the activities that were being conducted, this capacity building, this training of forces, were actually, could actually be used against the people and actually exacerbate violence. Is that right? Um, it could, but, but it was because it, um, we misunderstood the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. So if you think the problem is a weak state, then you strengthen the state. Mm -hmm. And occasionally that is the problem. So in the book, I actually tell the story of Theodore Roosevelt. If, if you look in American history, um, we had two parts of our country that were experiencing a lot of violence at the same time after the Civil War. You had the Wild West and you had the South, post-Civil War South. And the Wild West had as astronomical levels of violence. I mean, violence at the level of Medellin, at the height of its drug cartels. Um, and I tell the story of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, w when he was a young man, had a, a ranch in the Badlands, um, a cattle ranch, and someone stole his boat. And he goes to um, find the thieves of his boat. And being Roosevelt, he builds a raft with his ranch hands. And they go down the river to get the boat. And they find the three thieves and actually um, have a picture. I can't remember if I put it in the book or not. I don't think I got the rights to it. But um, there's a picture of Roosevelt sitting there with a rifle pointed at these three thieves. And then the river froze. And so for eight days, he's stuck on this frozen river, trying to ford it. They finally hit land. His ranch hands go back to the ranch. He borrows a wagon and for 40 hours walks overland with, um, with his prisoners to get them to a jail. That's a weak state. And when he gets to the jail, the, the person who lent him the wagon said, why didn't you just shoot the guys? Mm. Because that was what any sensible person would do in that kind of a weak state. So that was a weak state problem. But the South was very different. And when I went around the world looking at various countries, trying to understand what was causing the violence, it looked a lot more like the US South than like the Wild West. And so um, you wrote this book, and you came up with uh, a number of ideas in terms of how to actually manage or at least approach these issues. And, and you have prescriptions within the book as well. And I think there are five dominant ideas that you work on. Is that right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, could you go through perhaps, how, or maybe I'm putting it on the spot. Uh, I actually can't remember okay. all five of the ideas. Well, I think it's so Sorry, I wrote them very well, I'm you sure. You did. It's <laughs> actually quite good. And, but, and by the way, that chapter on the Wild West versus the South is really terrific because uh, you talk about the period post-Reconstruction where, where, in fact, violence becomes a part of the state apparatus for controlling that, that entire uh, the, for controlling the South. So that's definitely one of the ideas. So yes. um, I, can, I can talk to that one. So one of the ideas is definitely that um, what we think of as weak states, uh, they occasionally exist, Somalia is a weak state, but much more common are these complicit states. And so what you had in the South was um, politicians who no longer thought they could win a legitimate election. Um, blacks were enfranchised, Confederates were disenfranchised, the old Confederacy wanted to rise again. How are they going to do it? Well, the Ku Klux Klan had started up, and so had about 20 other night rider groups. They called them night riders because they rode their horses at night. And the politicians basically make this implicit deal with these white supremacist organizations. They say, you can carry out your violence, and we won't arrest you for it, and if we get power back, we'll let you do this with impunity. So they had different goals. The white supremacists were just racist white supremacists. But they shared common um, needs. And so as the white supremacists uh, terrorized blacks, they were also terrorizing Republicans, because a lot of African Americans had joined Lincoln's party. And so the Dixiecrats, the de Democrats at the time, um, were able to come back. So you'd, you saw lynchings increase before uh, elections. Um, you saw them go down when Jim Crow laws were passed, because Jim Crow was the way that we learned to disenfranchise without violence. Um, but it, right on the edge of Jim Crow, 1892 was when the violence peaked. That was 30 years after the end of the Civil War. The institutions were all there, and yet someone was being killed in the South every 36 hours. Um, and so that kind of violence, that kind of pogrom, I argue, 
happens because it was allowed to, and it was allowed to because the Confederates wanted power, and as they got power, they were able to roll back the laws and, and protect these violent groups so that 16 years after the end of the Civil War, we had Confederates in power in every southern state and every major state office. So the South basically won the peace. Um, and that, I argue, is what's going on in these violent states, that they're still teaming up with violent groups for various ends. Right. And so you go around the world. You spend a lot of time traveling and uh, visiting various parts of the world, uh, looking at how violence has been a governing strategy in some of these states. Can you talk about one or two? I know, that, for instance, you mentioned Colombia mm -hmm. just recently. Mm -hmm. You talked about Medellin when you were comparing it to uh, parts of, uh, of the United States. Uh, maybe you can talk about that status, and perhaps later we can talk about its transformation. Absolutely. So it's a hopeful book. Let me start yes. with, you know, I try to write things that, um, that actually are solving the problem. And I, so I looked all over the world at places that had gotten better and places that hadn't gotten better and what was the difference. And um, so Colombia is one of them. Sicily might be a more exciting one mm -hmm. for, because people know Sicily and the mob. There's a, a letter that, you fa that I found from, I think, 1898. Um, in Sicily, they were experiencing a huge amount of violence, and they sent down from Rome a kind of investigatory mission. What the heck is going on in Sicily? Why is there all this violence? And the guy writes back this, this sort of heartbreaking letter where he's a, a police commissioner, and he writes back, every single thing that we later found out about the Sicilian mob in the 1990s the 1890s, so 100 years earlier, he's writing about the mob initiation rituals and how they control things, and he says, sadly, I'm going to need your help to fight this phenomenon because they're deeply tied in with the local politicians, and they're being protected by all the local political um, entities, and lo and behold, we did not solve that problem for another 100 years, um, and so that's what you see in these countries. You see in Sicily, the Christian Democratic Party um, had the mafia helping them get out the vote, and the mafia would then be rewarded with contracts. The contracts would let them hire more people for construction and so on, and that would let them get out more vote because they had more people on their payroll. Um, in Colombia, you saw the paramilitary groups that were supported by the drug cartels. The drug cartels had formed these paramilitaries as like their action arm, and um, the paramilitary groups were funding campaigns. So at the height of it, a third of the Colombian parliament had their campaigns paid for through these paramilitary groups. Um, in Jamaica, you saw the gangs um, that were helping suppress the vote for the politicians in Jamaica. And so in each case, there's different reasons why the politicians are teaming up, but the outcome is the same. They have to give impunity to their violent group. So, uh, well, that's, that's interesting. And you also looked at other parts as well. We looked at, you looked at Georgia, again, in a very positive sense with an optimistic outcome because when we look at how Georgia has evolved having both been first in the Soviet Union, then in Russia when they were, the constituent states were remaining. Um, um, maybe we can touch a little bit on that. And what is it that in fact brings them from this state of violence that is, state, that is a governing strategy to one where they are able to in fact ameliorate the violence and maybe allow for the forces that are monopolizing the violence, the police forces or the security forces, to fall in line and to actually be responsive to citizenry and to uh, a leadership. Sure. So I'll, I'll give two minutes on sort of the path into the violence, and then I'll give a longer answer on the path out of the violence. Okay. So, you know, it starts with these politicians who are teaming up with the violent groups. Then they have to protect the violent groups. And so to protect the violent groups, they need police that are malleable. They need courts that are malleable. And so they basically weaken their institutions. They politicize those institutions. The police who are politicized tend to become brutal over time. And in the book, I get into why that is. I'm going to go, go quickly here because I want to get to the solution set. But basically, the police become quite brutal. But they tend to be brutal against the poor and the marginalized, not the middle class, because these are democracies. The deal in the democracies is leave the middle class voters alone. And so it's usually accidental that they hit the middle class. Meanwhile, they're hitting um, and extorting and harming these poor and marginalized areas. Well, what do those people do? The middle class can buy their way into gated communities, and they can buy private security, and they do. The poor can't. And so gangs come in, mafia groups come in, and they say, look, we'll protect you against the other gangs and against the police. We'll protect you against the state, um, often for a price. It's often extortionary. 
but nevertheless, they do offer some protection. And then those groups also pose as Robin Hood. So you see this over and over and over again that these groups come in and they build, Pablo Escobar built public housing. You know, yes. he ran the Medellin cartel, but he built the public housing. Uh, you see these muscle men in India come in, and one of them that I chronicle built a whole women's college. Um, you know, serious philanthropy. Yes. And so what do the poor do? The poor feel that they're stuck between a criminal state and actual criminals, and telling the difference is a lot more murky on the ground. And so there becomes violence that then gets kind of ubiquitous. And the worst part of this, there's a chapter in the book about decivilization. Mm -hmm. The worst part of it is that the regular people start turning to violence. So it's one thing to have the professionals using violence, but as impunity grows and regular people start turning to violence, to domestic violence, bar fights, things like that, start growing and growing and growing and getting out of hand. So when that's your problem, the issue starts with the state, but it starts to saturate society. So you're saying, and you're calling this de-civilization. So in other words, places that have perhaps experienced a civilized uh, form of daily life uh, start really devolving uh, and turning to violence in a much more broadened and much more general pop popular sense. That's right. That's right. And I don't use that to mean any particular culture is decivilized. Mm -hmm. I say very explicitly this happened in America on the eve of our civil war. This can happen anywhere where the state does not keep order. And if the state doesn't keep order and it falls back on regular people, basically it incentivizes people to um, welcome sociopaths into their midst. Mm -hmm. Because if you need protection from others, suddenly the sociopath in your midst doesn't look so bad if they're on your side as opposed to the other side, and you put up with a lot. And so I go back to the Middle Ages and talk about this phenomena of state building and how it looks in the Middle Ages and how it looks today in a place like Afghanistan. So that's the bad news. Right. But the good news <laughs> okay. is that so you know, once... So we've de now. we de the whole... Rampant but, violence everywhere, and, uh, and but the now, yes. There is good news here, and what I found was the most hopeful part of this is that if violence is caused by war, there's not much people can do, right? Unless you're the warlord or the head of the country or the secretary general of the United Nations, very few people have a say in war. But this kind of violence that's based in this rotten governing order, voters have a say in. Regular middle class people have a say in. And so what I found was the trigger, and I see someone in the back here who helped me find this trigger, so I will um, thank him personally afterward when we talked about an early version of this book. But what I found was the trigger was violence starts to spill over and starts hit, hitting the middle class. And usually that's accidental. Usually the violent groups are fighting within themselves. They don't mean to use too much violence, but there's a mafia war. The drug cartels are fighting over turf. Something internal is going on. So they start fighting too much. The violence spills over. It hits the middle class. And then the middle class has to do something because suddenly they're a target. They can ignore this problem for a really long time, and they do because it's hitting poor people, marginalized people, people in other neighborhoods. The violence is really bad in East LA, but it's not bad in Beverly Hills, right? But um, as it starts hitting the middle class, they have to act. The politicians try to sell them tough on crime policies. Mm -hmm. And you see it all over the world, these tough on crime policies. And it turns out they backfire all over the world because when you throw a lot of criminals in jail with other criminals, a couple things happen. First, they learn from each other and they get more sophisticated. And they get, um, the jail conditions get worse and worse and worse. And as the conditions get worse, the gangs get more power. So you're suggesting that tough on crime policies actually breed violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's tons of research to, to show that. I go through some of it in the book. Um, but all over the world, those kind of monodura, tough on crime policies breed a lot more violence. And that actually gives the politicians who are running this savage order an excuse to use more repression. So you're seeing this in Brazil right now. The, the repression is bad, we're going to use tough on crime policies, we're going to um, make gun ownership much more easy, we're gonna do shoot to kill, we're going to stop, um, stop chastising police if they kill people extrajudicially. Not surprising, the violence skyrockets. And then the state says, well now we're really gonna get tough, now we're gonna further arm people. And that, so you get this further violence that upholds the whole governing order. So the middle class tends to like that, actually, and they vote for it. Um, it's, it's a very big vote winner everywhere it's offered because it often protects the middle class. The violence spirals, but not in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. they, they are protected. And so what you tend to need is a social movement. And in the book, I tell the story of the civil rights movement. 
but a social movement that convinces the middle class voters that actually those tough on crime policies aren't the way to go, that what they need is a more inclusive state. They need to break this savage governing order. So you have this vicious cycle that you just described, and you're saying that to get out of this, you have to have a catalyst, a movement or some form of political leadership or maybe even groups of middle class people who have, uh, who have combined and, and have started the beginnings of a virtuous cycle the ability is to actually fight back because they no longer believe that this tough on crime policy is serving them. So it seems like there's a step of education that needs to be, or maybe it's just something that they feel. Is this, or it depends on which country you're in or which society you're looking at. Definitely what mobilization. What is the catalyst? Mobilization. Mobilization, but I don't think it's quite the same as education. Mm -hmm. um, people can be quite educated and not mobilized. Mm -hmm. Um, they can feel powerless. They can feel that they don't have a kind of hub around which to gather. So it takes social organizers to really um, bring people together. And the book is both a, a pay on the great man theory and a, an um, antidote to it yeah. because it says you need a good politician. And, and there's this chapter that I didn't expect to write when I wrote the book about how much you need good politicians and how they how important they are and how awful they are and how you need these kind of not particularly nice, not people I want at my dinner party, um, kind of slimy, deal-making politicians to do their jobs and we need to respect them more. But we also need these social organizers because the social organizers get people together, mobilize them, show them that their true interests lie in a more inclusive state. And then a politician has to take power because if you just have the movement and no politician, if you're too pure to work with a politician, you're not going anywhere. And in the book, I tell the story of the civil rights movement and Johnson, because when we tend to think about this, especially those of us who didn't live through it, we think, oh, President Johnson, he signed the Civil Rights Act, mm -hmm. what a great guy. Well, if you look at President Johnson, he was against every single civil rights bill as a, as a senator from Texas. He fought Harry Truman when Harry Truman desegregated the military. He voted against making lynching a crime. This was not a great, hope of, you know, it's not who you would think of. It's like partnering with um, uh, Senator Kyle or something, you right. know, for a left-wing cause. Um, but in office, he changed his mind, probably for self-interested reasons, for various reasons, and became the hope of this. It's easy to say, oh, great, you know, he changed his stripes. But think about what that's like if you're the social organizers. You have to lead your people into making a deal with someone who not only was so tainted but who was still prosecuting the Vietnam War. You know, so think about if you're leading the Occupy movement or Black Lives Matter, and you have to make a deal with some, something that compromised, and yet that's what has to happen. And, and you go further in the book because you suggest that not only do those who are the mobilizing uh, social forces need to figure out a way to compromise with a more malleable politician, but that politician has to be able to deal with some of the most, some of the ugliest forces within that society and be able to make what you call dirty deals. That's right. This was the chapter that I was most uncomfortable about. And I actually talked with all of my anti corruption friends about, you know, how do I write this chapter? Because what the research was leading to was a, f a finding that I didn't like at all, which was that. These states aren't weak to begin with, but they've been deliberately weakened. But once they're deliberately weakened, they don't have a lot of capacity to fight. The cops are completely riddled with ties to organized crime. They're not going to go after the problematic, you know, the U.S. and Colombia was feeding intelligence to the Colombian government. And every time they said, you know, go raid this entity, that entity was tipped off ahead of time, right? So you just can't fight. Um, because the state is so broken. So the first thing these politicians have to do is make what I call dirty deals. Mm -hmm. um, DFID, uh, my salary is paid for by the British government. DFID is their aid agency. Um, they're required by law to give half of all of their aid to fragile and conflict-affected states, and so they want to know how to do it better. And um, they call these things elite bargains. Yes. Um, and that is what they are. <laughs> I call them dirty deals. Because what they basically are is saying, okay, you put down your weapons and you'll get a cut of the state you'll get some level of corruption and some level of impunity. And I didn't like that finding, but I found it in every case. The other side of that, though, is that they don't last. So they herald what I call a false peace. So you need to make them, but if you let them fester, you basically further break your state. You further corrupt your state. 
you lose more and more legitimacy. So you have to make them while the state is weak, but then you immediately have to start building up state strength and regaining the trust of your people. And that's a very tough dance. I found in India, um, one of the politicians, Nitish Kumar, did that as one person, but often it was different levels of politicians. You have a President Uribe making dirty deals with the paramilitaries in Colombia, but he's not making a more inclusive state. It's the mayors who are making a more inclusive state at their at their mayoral level, and together it, the duo works. So as you look at this, because this is a, you, just by talking about the difference between the centralized state versus the mayoral, the local, regional, state level, or you know, if in a federal system, mm -hmm. a more state level, did you find that there is a, a greater ability to act on the local level or on the state level rather than at the nation state level? It differed in different states. So in the U.S. South, it took the federal government to finally force through in the 1960s some level of, of peace to that society and to enforce the rules. Until then, that had been basically a one-party state held together by violence among that whole region. Um, in Colombia, it was the city level that was able to make headway against the federal government. But it really, it depends what portion of government has been making these deals and then what part of government has not been making the same kind of deals. And as you looked at your research, uh, did you notice any demographic particularities? In particular, uh, were older people or younger people? And I'm particularly interested in, you know, when we often look at these movements, you often see that they're youth-led or student-directed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did you notice any demographic particularities as you, uh, as you broke up your research? Um, well, the most obvious is that men commit violence. Mm -hmm. um, by far, <laughs> and young men commit violence. So your violence problem is basically a problem of men between the ages of 16 and 30. Um, and this leads to all sorts of interesting solutions that are much easier than changing your state, but I will not mention them, um, one can imagine. Um, so that, that's just the demographic, and I think that gets to biology and things like that. Um, in terms of who makes the change and how that change is made, um, students often play a big role um, in all sorts of social movements. They don't have much to lose, but since they're also causing the violence, uh, <laughs> there's sort of a canceling out effect. I think the biggest finding we have in this field, and I, I cite her extensively in the book, is that um, two women, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, uh, did a very fa fabulous academic study of nonviolent social movements. And what they found was that nonviolent social movements actually win and change things much, much more commonly than violence and much more commonly than we expect. But only when they have a particular uh, demographic layout, which is that they need to be broad-based. They need to encompass a lot of parts of society. And when I talked with Erica about it, I said, you know, is the issue really, really that they're just big? You need a lot of people. She said, well, you need a lot of people. It helps to have a big movement when you're talking about voters changing a structure of society. But they have to be broad. And, and what I came to realize in the book was that these are very polarized societies. By definition, the violence happens in highly unequal, highly polarized societies. And by the way, four of the most violent cities on earth are here in America. Um, and which so, are which ones? Uh, Detroit, St. Louis, New Orleans, and uh, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Um, but per capita, that's how you count this kind yeah. of violence. Chicago would go up if you count absolutes. Um, but when you have a highly polarized society, it becomes very easy to dismiss this kind of governing violence. In Sicily, for instance, it was well known that the Christian Democratic Party worked with the mafia, but the other party that stood to benefit from pointing this out was the Communist Party. So the Communists would say, guess what? Here's another politician, here's all their links to the mafia, and they'd print that in their communist newspaper. And then the apologists for the Christian Democratic Party would say, well, the communists are saying that, and they're paid for by the Soviets. And they were paid for by the Soviets. The Italian Communist Party was the biggest uh, receiver of Soviet international money. And so it just canceled each other out. Nobody listened to the accusation. That polarization means that to create a functional social movement, you need a lot of people, but you need them from across those divides. If it's all from one side, even if it's 51%, it's too divisive and you get your apologist for violence on the other side, mm -hmm. stopping anything from happening. So you really need to bridge that polarized divide. And so, you know, in your work and your relationship with the State Department, I know you were consulting in, on a research board, is that right, or no, an advisory board for mm -hmm. uh, when, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Uh, the discussion is often on questions of civil society and 
building capacity, not just in the security forces, but building civil capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the type of thing you were advising at the time when you were, when you were doing your advisory board work? Absolutely, and it's a hard, uh, hard push in the State Department. Um, there are people who really want that, and um, some parts of our State Department really, really like engaging with society, but it's tough. I see a friend who worked in the State Department smiling in the back. It's tough because one part of the State Department's job is to make sure that when a senior level congressional member or president wants to go to a country, that the president of that country or the senior leadership of that country will meet with that person. Mm -hmm. It would be embarrassing if our senior leadership can't meet with the leaders of another country. Well, in this kind of a governing structure, if you have that kind of a problem and then the civil society is fighting the government, you can imagine that it's a little bit hard to partner too closely with civil society and then you don't get your meetings. And so different parts of our State Department feel differently about that divide and act differently as a result. So I would say that there's a lot of internal uh, butting of heads about how close we can get to civil society. So uh, when you look at the current administration, and I know you said you didn't want to really talk about politics, and you don't have to talk about politics. Really, it's a question of where is this uh, administration maybe doing certain things right or where it's doing certain things wrong uh, along, the, along your findings. You know, where are they aiding and abetting uh, violence, and where are they actually ameliorating it? So this administration's really funny. Um, I'm not at all an apologist for the Trump administration by any vast stretch of the imagination. But um, because they have slashed the funding for SOUTHCOM, which is our southern command, our military command in Latin America, and for AFRICOM, our military command in Africa, we actually have less funding to do dumb things. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was not <laughs> Rosa screwing up her face. Um, uh, it's not on purpose. I don't give them any credit for that. Um, but you do see uh, some tough choices being made that weren't being made before. Now, the Obama administration did a lot of things right, too. So this administration, for instance, has said um, they're taking away all the metrics on, on killing of civilians inadvertently. And so guess what? When you stop counting that, um, bad things happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so their policy decisions are almost always wrong when they're making them consciously, but a handful of the decisions have inadvertently uh, done some positive good by reducing. We give security sector assistance to about two-thirds of all countries in the world, um, and usually that money is too little to build much security and just enough to keep bad forces in power, um, to keep corruption flowing. It's, it's sort of the worst of all possible worlds, and um, cutting that back and being a little more discerning about that would be really useful. Now, at the same time that they're cutting back the money, they're also trying to fight a great power war. Um, everyone is very happy that we're no longer in the business of fighting terrorists all the time. What they really want to do is fight China and Russia, and they want to fight them by gaining allies, by giving them more security funding. So there's a lot of like taking with one hand and giving with the other kind of activity going on. Well, at this portion of, the, of our meeting, uh, I've been collecting cards from around the audience, and uh, I will ask a few of the questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you to hopscotch around the world here because uh, one of the questioners asked, what are hot spot violent places today that we don't hear about normally? So uh, as you look around, and, and you do, uh, where do you see some of these places that don't necessarily make the front pages of our newspapers or mm -hmm. the top of our news feeds? Um, so this is a little bit of a hard question to answer because the statistics are so bad. Um, really stunningly bad. We don't count these things uh, very well at all. The part of the world that's almost completely a blank is sub-Saharan Africa. So if you ask a violence researcher, their knee-jerk reaction is, oh, Latin America is the most violent part of the world, and Brazil, and then we'll go to Mexico and sort of hit those. But the reality is we actually know nothing about sub-Saharan Africa, and all our models that extrapolate have algorithms that aren't based on reality for that part of the world. So I would say um, South Sudan is looking really, really bad, and nobody is talking about it at all. Um, that's a more traditional war, but like all civil wars, there's an awful lot of regular violence hiding under the guise of the civil war. Um, Brazil, as I've already mentioned, the Central American Northern Triangle is one of the most violent regions in the world. And if you look at the, the immigrants coming to our border that are causing so much political havoc here, almost all of them are from Central America. They're not from Mexico. 
um, and they're fleeing immense violence. And our refugee laws were written after World War II in a way that actually um, enabled us to do something about this violence. After World War II, they recognized that Hitler used brown shirts. Hitler used these non-state violent groups to carry out his plan. And so they said, you can be a refugee if your state does nothing about violence, as well as if it's the one committing the violence. But Jeff Sessions crossed that line out of our refugee, like literally just crossed it out in a memo that he wrote. And um, so now we, we don't follow that bit of refugee law internationally. Uh, that was a pretty depressing walk around the world. Uh, you asked about the violent I places. Did, I can ask about I, better but places. I, it wasn't my question. <laughs> uh, but uh, So let me ask you about a good uh, part of the world. I mean, Slovakia just had uh, an, an election, and a lot of what just happened there came out of direct violence and random violence, or maybe it wasn't so random. It seemed it was targeted against a journalist mm -hmm, and his fiance. Mm -hmm. And there is a popular reaction. There was there were demonstrations in the streets. There was the the uh, government resigned, and then they just had elections with this sort of very progressive, uh, forward thinking and forward looking uh, leader. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. So that's a good one. It's a good story. Okay. Slovakia, Slovakia is a good, is a good story. One. Look the at Republic Slovakia. of Georgia is a good story. There's a number of good yes, stories. Yes, Republic yeah. of Georgia, where I, I used to watch the ads. Uh, so I, I lived overseas for a number of years, and uh, every once in a while you'd see a commercial for Georgia trying to. In, get people to invest in this country. And one of the things that they would prominently show in this advertisement was their new police station. And maybe you could talk about this. Um, sure, so the, the Georgia story is one of my favorite. I, I didn't travel to places because they had good food. I traveled to places <laughs> because wine. they had violence. But <laughs> Georgia happens to have really good food. So it was a particular pleasure to do the work there. And it's an interesting story. I mean, Georgia basically had violence that looked like Libya's violence today. They had a civil war. On top of the civil war, they had gang violence. They had a whole series of militias that um, were, were fighting each other in the streets. Um, I was talking to uh, David Usapashvili, who was the um, head of parliament when I talked to him, but he was a 25-year-old law graduate who has his first job, um, was the basically the special assistant general counsel to the president right after the fall of the Soviet Union. And he was saying that when he was in that role, they had a National Security Council meeting in the early 90s when all this violence was going on, and that um, the president, Shevardnadze, stopped the meeting in the beginning and said, hey, I've been handed a piece of paper. It says here that your guys are killing each other on the streets of Tbilisi. So my minister of interior and my minister of defense, I need you guys to sort this out, and we're going to stop this meeting until you do that. Because the way that he had tried to deal with all the violence was to bring the two of the main warlords into government. So he gave one of them the Defense Department, he gave the other one the Ministry of Interior, and they basically ran them as smuggling rings and um, just violent, corrupt rings. So it, it stopped part of the Civil War, but it didn't stop the violence in the street. And so Georgia started to contain its Libya-like violence, but um, then Shevardnadze basically started giving everyone a cut of the state. So uh, Usapashvili was, ba was uh, describing how it worked, and he would take the, you know, if you have your warlord up here and he has his, you know, five minions down here, Chef Renazzo would go out to lunch with, with each of those minions and say, okay, here, I'm going to give you your own fiefdom, and now you can take your own cut of the money, you can hire your own patronage appointees. And so pretty soon the whole structure of his security services was riddled with these patronage appointees that were basically running gas smuggling rings, cigarette smuggling rings. None of them were actually policing the state. But what happened was that then when he wanted to go after the top warlords, the underlings were loyal to Shevardnadze, not to their leader. And so it allowed him to, having made all these dirty deals, to then arrest the, the leadership. And there's, it's a much more dramatic story yes. that I tell in there. But, um, but he arrests the leadership. But then the state just rots from within. And so over the next decade, you see the state of Georgia just fall apart. You know, people are buying their medical degrees, so you can't trust going to the doctor because the doctor knows nothing about being a doctor. People are um, siphoning off so much electricity that the electricity keeps, uh, keeps going out. And so the whole state is just disint disintegrating, and they have a rose revolution. Yes. You know, Saakashvili leads a movement and has a revolution and says, I'm going to end the corruption. But then, as these things go, he does end the corruption. He fights all of this um, rot because he starts a new governing order. 
But then he becomes a little too autocratic for his own good, and he starts to um, throw more and more people in jail, and he starts to use the surveillance that he used against the organized crime, against his political opponents, and things get a little sketchy, and then the people throw him out. And so Georgia ends up being this really positive story of how the people take back their state, not just once, but multiple times. Yeah. Each time it gets a little better, then it gets a little worse, then they take it back again. And that's how these stories go. That's not... Uh, I have a four-year-old, you know, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> it's it's a tough, realistic story, but these countries get better. Yeah, and the symbolic nature of this police station that I was talking about is that it's all glass. And so the concept Sorry, of transparency, yeah. it's okay, you gave me an opening there. <laughs> but that is, that is uh, the result of mm -hmm. their trying to actually show that, in fact, they've evolved and that they have achieved a certain level of transparency within their own government. Uh, one of our audience members asks, what are your thoughts on the, quote, broken window theory? Uh, are there instances where it has worked abroad? And the broken window theory is if you see a window that's broken within a city, you immediately repair it or you paint over graffiti so that you actually create a level of cleanliness within the city in the, the sense that there is no crime being committed or at least that the crime is being managed. Yeah, so there was about 10 pages of the book on broken window theory that I think got reduced to a one very long footnote. Um, <laughs> I had to cut about a third of the manuscript. <laughs> so that was one of the things that got condensed. But um, basically, broken windows theory, when you read the original article by the sociologist who wrote it, it was a theory about disorder. And the theory was that disorder um, leads to crime. That when people see kind of an unloved neighborhood with lots of graffiti and broken windows and so on, that they're more willing to commit crime. What the research shows is that that's not true. Disorder leads to disorder. And so if you've got a place with glass on the ground and graffiti, more people will come and graffiti, more people will dump trash, more people will pee on the street. There will be lots of antisocial behavior that agglomerates to those places. It doesn't lead to violent crime. Violent crime is very different. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. People feel scared in those places. And what the sociologist who wrote the article was actually saying was that fear matters, that people shouldn't have to feel scared in their cities. And that that alone was a good thing to fight that fear. And I think he's right about that. The disorder is a problem in and of itself. It doesn't need to be violence. But the reality is that the kinds of people who commit violence and the kinds of people who pee on the street are different kinds of people. And solving one does not solve the other. Right. So no equating uh, decivilization necessarily with disorder. Mm -hmm. But they mm -hmm. can correlate in certain in instances. Uh, they can correlate, but the causation isn't, right. isn't the same. Yeah. Uh, another uh, questioner asked, given your research on advancing the rule of law abroad and time with Hillary Clinton, how do you see the United States' role changing in decreasing violent states? What does the situation in Venezuela tell us. Sure. So I would say that, um, you know, this, this has been a largely internal story of what's going on in these countries. But um, before we get too complacent in America, we should remember that the reason Latin America is the most violent region is not the Latin American culture. You know, people talk about culture a lot. Colombia went from extremely violent to very nonviolent. Venezuela is now the most violent country in the world. They've got very similar cultures. Nothing much has changed in their cultures that fast. What's really going on is that the U.S. is the biggest drug market in the world. Cocaine is grown at a certain latitude, and that latitude happens to work really well in a lot of these countries. And so all these countries in between, the drugs are going to go somewhere. And so this is really a theory of why will they go here rather than here? You know, why are they in Guatemala and not in Costa Rica? And it has to do with this kind of elite structure. But as long as the demand for drugs is coming from us, it's going to go somewhere. And on top of that, a lot of this violence is caused by corruption. A lot of it is that leaders want to steal money. They're not laundering that money through Nigeria. They're laundering it through New York. They're laundering it through London, through Miami. The property markets of Miami are so bad that actually um, Senator Rubio has put in legislation to try to fight shell companies, which are these companies that kind of hide the money through you know, one shell over another shell over another shell until you can't trace where the money goes back. And we're, America's particularly bad in this regard. Delaware has opened up this whole host of room for easy formation of fake companies. So um, we have a real role to play in this. And when you look at Venezuela, 
I mean, um, I happen to be friends with the guy who's mayor of a part of Caracas. Caracas is like New York. It's got different boroughs, and he's kind of mayor of Brooklyn, as it were, or was mayor of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. He's fled. Um, he did a pretty good job of fighting violence within his portion of Venezuela, but it's a governing strategy in Venezuela. The military there is called the Golden Cartel. Um, they sell a huge amount of drugs. There's now 3,000 generals. Um, they have no external enemies, really. Uh, you know, the generalships are just a way for the governing order to hold power. What's America's role in this? Well, I actually think Trump did the right thing here. I wish Obama had done it, but I think Trump did the right thing by finding one of the few ways in which he could use leverage. The problem was, in pure Trumpian fashion, he didn't think two steps ahead. Mm -hmm. He thought of the first step. He didn't think of what happens when that doesn't work. What's going to get, I, I actually have been working with a group of um, Venezuelans who are trying to think about how you negotiate a solution to this. Because the reality is, if you're part of the military running a drug cartel, there is very little reason to step down. If you step down, you're going to be prosecuted in international court. Um, you're going to lose your power. You're going to lose your money. Why in the world would you do that? And so force is not going to work. We're not going to bomb Venezuela, nor should we. And simply creating a showdown the way Trump did without thinking about how do you negotiate those generals out of that position is just dumb. Yeah. So, you know, does the U.S. have a role to play in this? Absolutely we do, but we're not playing our cards particularly well. I, I couldn't agree more. I wrote a piece recently for the McClatchy chain that appeared throughout the McClatchy newspaper chain called Venezuela's Mexican Standoff, which is how we're now uh, really the, the situation in which we're now caught. Um, Dave in the audience asks, is it a coincidence that in Asia the most violent countries, and he cites Philippines and India, have the most historical Western influence? That's an interesting question. Um, I do not know. I think the the um, issue in both those countries is is really the power structure. In in the Philippines, it's long been controlled by an oligarchic group of families, and um, for a while, an authoritarian leader stood at the top of that oligarchic group of families and kind of divvied up the spoils. Then, for a very short while, you had a pseudo democracy that started to break that up. But then the oligarchs kind of regained power again, and they have their private armies and their ways of sewing up power in their regions. So um, so the Philippines, I would say, it's more to do with that power structure. Now, did we contribute to that power structure? I have to know more of Filipino history. It's not a case study of mine. India, I know better. In India, I would say the real issue there is, is a feudal power structure. And that feudal power structure does have something to do with the British, that um, the British came in and decided they were going to rule indirectly with a very small civil service and um, and to tax the people. And what that led to was famine. That They taxed too much and they caused a huge famine. And in an effort to reform that system, they actually created a, a structure that um, they thought would give the feudal lords a chance to reinvest. So they said, we'll collect a certain amount of taxes, but we're not going to overtax. And the goal had been actually that the feudal lords were supposed to then reinvest the extra money that they could make into their um, holdings. But what it really did in, in practice was made these feudal lords basically judge and jury and executioner over the people, the serfs underneath them. And because of that structure of power that was then sanctified by religion, by the caste system, saying that it was okay to do these things religiously, you created this just hold on that part of the part of the world. And so in Uttar Pradesh, where I used to work in Bihar, you have what looks medieval, you know, these landlords who control the people under them. I remember in one of the villages that I used to, to work in, the landlords were running a microcredit program and trying to get people to, to start small businesses, you know, like a bicycle repair shop or a barber shop, really small businesses. Um, the landlords didn't like that because it broke their hold on wage earnings and, and made it so that they couldn't keep all the wages down. And so first they said that our group was taking all the women and turning them into prostitutes because we were taking them from village to village to teach them about microenterprise in other villages. They said, you know, we're turning all the women into prostitutes. And then they said that we were stealing the children and feeding them to lions um, because there were lions that were in that that region, and it was a somewhat credible threat. But the things that the landlords did, and then they started using incredible violence against um, the Dalits to hold on to the wages. So that feudal structure, the Brits did contribute to, but 
there's plenty of blame to go around. Yeah, in fact, I, I met with uh, President Zia al Haq years ago uh, from Pakistan, the dictator who uh, tried to tell me that the reason for flogging was that it was an inherited practice that they had uh, taken from the Brits and that it was a practice that they were going to continue, but it was one that they, it was foisted upon them and that they had, it was a learned behavior, in fact, and one that they were continuing. Um, let me ask you the final question here, and it again comes from the audience, and, and, and maybe we can focus on the positives of how we actually come out of this, because your book is also pres pres prescriptive, and at the end of it, you have this optimistic tone that, in fact, we need to work, now that we know what the, what, what the problems are and how we can work towards these solutions, it's incumbent on us to try and do this. So uh, the final question is, what are the elements of a successful peace deal? What are the warning signs that it will not work? And how can these elements be replicated at local levels in violent places? Um, it's a great question. And it's a, it's a contentious question. So right now there's a very big lobby that says that a more inclusive peace deal, a peace deal that brings in more different groups is more likely to hold. And that's true. But um, it's a correlation, not causation, if you look across a lot of peace deals. And the problem is that if you have a peace deal that brings in a lot of groups, ipso facto, the main warlords were not as strong. They couldn't keep out all the other players. And so it's not surprising that a more inclusive peace deal also leads to greater peace because the warlords were probably less powerful in those situations. So one of the things I'm actually looking at now with the British government is when you can't get a great peace deal, when you have to take a so-so peace deal, a problematic peace deal, how do you turn it into a better peace? Because I think that's the harder question. If you can get a good peace deal that's broad and inclusive and brings in all the different groups and brings women to the table, by all means, we should do that. That's the best thing we could do. But in most cases, the, um, the entities that want to use violence to get their way don't want that to happen. And if they're powerful enough in the streets, they'll keep it from happening. So the harder question is, how do you take a pretty bad deal and make it better? And I actually think that there's a lot of things we can do. We haven't tried that yet. We've, we always try to get the perfect and then make it kind of the enemy of the good. And then you get Colombia. You know, Colombia had a peace deal that was a pretty great peace deal. And then it opened room for spoilers, as we call them, for Uribe and his minions to go out and campaign against it. And then they turned it into a peace deal in which the military and the paramilitaries really got off scot-free, probably in um, contradiction to international law. And so now you have a pretty mediocre peace deal. It's still better than no peace. And then the question is, okay, how do you build from here? Right. So what is it then you, I, and it sounds like you're hard at work at this, but I and the members of the audience, what is it we can do? to try, now that we understand some of these root causes and really the violence uh, as, it, as it exists around the world, what is it that we as citizens can do in the United States to affect the solution and to affect solution to violence? Well, the good and the bad of it is that there's a lot we can do because we're part of the problem as well as, right. you know, so that means that we have a lot of agency. So from the very micro level, you know, if you're going to a country, so one of the things about these violent countries is that they often have a lot of tourism. Organized crime does not like poor countries. There's no money to be made in poor countries. They like growing economies. They like middle-income countries. So you see much more of this kind of violence in richer countries, more middle-income countries. So a lot of those have tourist trades. If you're going to one of those countries, if you're taking your vacation in Mexico and Jamaica and um, you know the Seychelles and some of these places, pay some attention to where you're staying. The nice resorts might well be owned by drug lords. It's pretty easy to find that out, actually. Um, when I went to Burma, a lot of the big resorts are owned by uh, really bloody generals little bit of Googling. In the book, I say, you know, we really need a trip advisor on this. We need, you know, next to the, like, family friendly, good for business, you could have a little rifle, <laughs> and it would show, you know, this one's owned by a really bad warlord, and this one's owned by a so, so you know, and you could figure out where to stay more easily. But until a trip advisor takes me up on that, we can at least, you know, do a little research ourselves and, and, um, and pay a little attention. We can change our mentality about some of these things. The way we talk about our politicians, um, you know, that they're dirty, that they make compromise, that these things are actually what we ask our politicians to do. You know, you can't have a democracy in a polarized climate without compromise. It doesn't work. It leads to violence. And so changing some of our mentality about the nature of compromise is really important and having a little more respect 
for the politicians who have to do that in order to prevent this kind of violence is really important. And then I think there's a lot we can do to pressure our legislators. So there's um, an act in play right now, the Global Fragility Act, that does some really good things. Um, I've helped write parts of the legislation or helped you know, mark up the legislation that other people had written more to the point. Um, and it's got some good stuff in it, and it's bipartisan, and it's likely to pass. And um, you can call your representatives and say you want them to support the Global Fragility Act. It's in both houses right now, both chambers. Um, there's some legislation on security sector reform that's being introduced in the House pretty soon and saying you don't want our security money to be going to states that sponsor violence. Very good thing to do. There's a whole slew of, of legislation that um, rein in shell companies that make it harder to launder money through the states. You can call and say, you know, we don't want that. I've got a website, rachelkleinfeld.com, where I write about this stuff. So if you, if you want uh, updates, you can go to my website and I'll say, you know, this piece of legislation's in play and you should go call your reps. But right now, the one that's in play is the Fragility Act. Well, there you go. A checklist of things you can do tonight, tomorrow, the next day. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for being here. Thank you all for joining us this evening.